Hey, good morning to those of you out there on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast. Russ, I don't know if you're here with us today, but I hear you're sick, so I hope you get well soon. And if you are here with us today, what the heck are you doing? Go rest. Um, before we get started, I just want to share a quick, uh, I keep saying tip, and that's the wrong thing, quick little insight into me. In 2024, I'm committed to trying to share a little bit more about me for six years I've been doing this. And really the only thing people know about me is that this guy has information about government contracting and how to succeed. And what I'd like to do is just to you know, share a little bit about me as we move forward. So th the thing I want to share today is um, how I got started in government contracting. Very quick uh, little insight. But I was in the army. So uh, for those who don't know, I was in the army. And the last place I worked in the army was for the secretary of the army. And when I got out of the when I was getting ready to get out, I was working for the Secretary of the Army and four stars. And one of the four stars introduced me to friends of his who were running a government contracting firm and said, hey, you got to pull this kid over here and work there. And they mentored me for like six months. And that's what pulled me into this industry is going to work for somebody else who was already in. And then I did a six month gig with a large uh, prime. And after that 12 month or so exit out of the Army, uh, I started my first government contracting business. But a similar journey that uh, maybe some of you have been on where you come out of um, the military in particular, right? Come out of the military, you go work for some other company and you decide, all right, I think I'm ready to hang my own shingle on the uh, outside of the building, as they say. So that's how I get started in government contracting. Quick little insight. If somebody can give me a quick AV check in the chat, I would appreciate that because we're going to dive into the training. I want to make sure I'm going. Um we got a lot of stuff to share today. So let me just get my technical stuff squared away. So actually, I think I started that a little too soon. Just checking on the tech. I don't see a tech. Sorry, I just want to make sure before I'm talking, I got uh, people letting me know we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and get started in today's training. And uh, one of the my favorite things about being a federal government contractor or being in the federal market is that the rules are really clear at uh, our expectation. Um, one of the things that I remember about just this understanding, this idea of rules is I was saying I was in the Army and I was uh, in the Army as a Ranger. And by the way, I'm going to pause for a second because I'm not seeing um, any AV checks. But I see myself, so maybe the chat's not working. Um, so when the chat gets working, somebody let me know. Or Gus, if you're around, if you can text me, that'd be good. Actually, if someone's feel generous, uh, you know, find my phone number in there. There you go. Thanks, Nina. All right, so let me get started. Um, I was saying... In today's training, we're going to be talking about um, going all in on the federal market. And one of my favorite things about being a federal government contractor is that the rules are so clear. And I remember back when um, I went into the Army, I went into the Rangers, right? And it's a pretty tough unit. And I still remember what it was like when I showed up to 2nd Battalion out there on Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, every morning we do uh, PT, physical training exercise, right? And so we go out. And I remember the first day I went out where uh, we were doing a different kind of exercise instead of running or push-ups or something. And we played this game called Hoppy. And all of us got into this, like a, uh, a company. We're inside of a this big circle. And um, not a company, a platoon. And we're in this big circle and we're, everybody's going around in a circle. And the only rule for Hoppy was that you couldn't tell anybody else the rules of the game. And it was just crazy, right? When you get into this environment. And this game was brutal, just you know, bear in mind, this is a long time ago when brutality was a lot more normal in the military. But basically, when it was your turn, you'd go up on one leg and you'd hop around on one foot. And um, and you you were it until you could tag somebody. And so you had all these people running around in circles around you. They could do anything they wanted. For example, they could come up, slam you right from behind and hit you hard, and knock you to the ground. And if they didn't get tagged by you, it was all fair game. It's brutal, right? It's a really brutal game. Um, which is the worst thing is most of us just liked it anyways. Um, well, working with the federal government, it's the complete opposite of Hoppy, right? Here, the rules couldn't be any more clear. And many, many people out there can explain it to you, which I really like, right? And that's why I'm doing today's training is that 
Um, I want to be able to talk about when you get into the federal market and you go all in on the federal market, you're going to have success and people will make sure that you're able to um, be a success in the market. Uh, there's this great line that I like um, when it relates to, as it relates to rabbits, right? If you're chasing two rabbits, you're not going to eat dinner tonight, right? I don't care if you're a vegetarian or not, right? If you're chasing two carrots, you're not going to eat tonight. And the idea is if you can't focus, then both of your prey will get away, whether it's a carrot or whether it's a rabbit, right? They'll get away from you. And focus is clear. Uh, focus is key. Excuse me. It's really important to have a clear, focused offer. What do we sell? We call this a core competency. If uh, when I work with customers, the first thing I do with them is say, forget about all this other stuff. We need to nail what you sell. So you need to be focused on that. And the second thing I talk about is you need to have a, a really clear target agency. You can't sell to the entire federal government. There's just too many agencies out there. Frankly, you can't even sell to the entire HHS or the entire Navy. You should pick an agency like CDC or command like NAVC. So even on the agency, you need to focus. Well, in the government um, or excuse me, in um, in business, we need to do the same thing on our market. We need to have a target market and choose it, go in. And I know there's many of us who are in um, state, local or education or nonprofit. I started, my last company started in uh, commercial and then nonprofit and other stuff. And we were bouncing around. I wish people had, had kind of told me this, but when you're all around, um, it gets hard. So I'm recommending to you in today's training that you need to focus and cover down on the um, one market. So I'll guide you through that uh, thinking, that thought process I have. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to my federal sales training, where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner, and since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. In fact, it's exactly what I like about today's training, how clear that process is, why I like doubling down on the federal market. A process is A to Z. When you follow that process, you can have repeatable, predictable results. And one of the things you want is a clear uh, process. The federal market has a very clear process, pretty much one process for the entire federal government. Um, if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. I put out a ton of content out there in the newsletter. I keep putting in a lot of good stuff. For example, today I just put out an, uh, an issue and it was about the seven step process for federal revenue success, right? And so in there is a great handout you can get. It's a video training on the seven step process. How do you move forward? So go ahead and subscribe to that. And then um, thank you for registering for today's training. Over hundred people registered for the training again. I really appreciate when you do that for several reasons. First off, when you register, LinkedIn is reminding you. And um, second, LinkedIn is letting other people know, hey, there's training going on and these people value it you might value it as well. If you didn't register for today's training, but you're here, do me a favor, please register for tomorrow's training and our future training. I've got um, tomorrow lined up, which is Friday, and I've got the next 20 days lined up, I uh, already plan to put out there. So register in there. And the last thing is never come alone. Please invite a friend, let others know about it. This is your community. And um, the more we invite in, the stronger our community becomes. I was just talking with somebody today, really quick side, um, that they were saying they had a meeting. In fact, Jay, you're probably in here. You can just say, hey, it was me. But Jay was telling me that he's having meetings with people he's finding and um, getting introduced into these sessions. So I'm doing the training. And in the background, you guys talk among yourselves, find people where there's a good uh, synergy and connect. OK, so let's talk about the markets. Um, this is a high level overview. I only got 20 minutes. And so I'm going to talk at a pretty fast clip here. But I just wanted to talk about at uh, the market at a high level and, and why I, I really drive down on this idea that if you're in the federal market, you should be all in on the federal market. I'm not telling you to get into the federal market, but if you're in, I'm recommending you get in the federal market. By the way, if you're an 8A company and you have a nine year window, I would be putting a huge amount of energy into succeeding with that um, uh, 8A certification that you have. Even if you do wanna go outside the federal market, you really wanna capitalize on this window you have. So this slide is a slide that I just put together to try to show, really understand markets, right? When you think about the federal market, they're all basically one group. And I'm going to show you, this is one company. I, um, a lot of us who are you know, experts like me, we all like to talk about things in different ways. And so um, one way I like to say this is the federal government. Today, I am saying the federal government is one customer. It's got a boss, the president running the executive branch. I don't care about the other two branches. Um, running the executive branch and there's all these agencies and all these people, but it all kind of comes together, right? And um, 
sometimes, right, we sit there and say, as it relates to people, it, uh, you have many, many different customers. So you have many different customers in one, uh, one market. And I'll give you an example of why I love the Army so much when I was in it was because I'm an entrepreneur. And, and back then, when I, before I joined the Army, I didn't know my personality, right? So I wouldn't stay at jobs long because I get bored. And then I realized it's because I like starting things and moving forward. It's why I like doing this is because I kept I get to keep helping companies start things. It's as if I'm working for hundreds of companies or something. Um, when I went in the army, it was awesome because I was able to change jobs in the army and I'm in one job army six years. Right. But I was able to change and keep up with my personality's need for you know a lot of activity type thing. Well, the federal markets, that same thing. I have this ability to keep in one market, but bounce around. And I'll expand on that in a minute. But on the left hand side, you can see I got the healthcare market, I got the commercial market, um, you know, big, big companies like Safeway or Geico or somebody, right? Um, you've got the state and local, so Maryland or New York. And the thing about these is they're all their own separate clouds. Uh, inside of the federal market, it's one cloud. We're all swimming in one direction. We're all operating basically the same way. But when you're in the commercial market, when you're in the state and local, and, and you're in all these markets, when you're in all of the markets, you never get a chance to really become good. It's as if you're trying to become a lawyer and a uh, an accountant and an IT person. And oh, AI is here. Let me learn that. We're well, never really going to get good at anything. And um, in business, there's this idea of uh, you may have heard this phrase, right? Um, uh, jack of all, I think, and master of none. Basically, focusing and being on a core competency means you're mastering a skill and you're mastering an area. Well, here you're uh, you're really mastering the understanding of the federal market. But when you try to do that in the commercial market, you can't. Every company is different. They operate different. Every state is different. Inside of every state, um, the organizations all operate differently. Counties are different. Police departments are different. Um, and there's really no um, going from one to the other to the other. It's not like if you work with New York, Maryland's like, oh, this is exciting. You know, come on over here. Now that I know that you work for New York, you can come here. No, it's a whole new world. And you're also fighting this prejudice of locality, right? This bias towards businesses that are in Texas. And so if you're in Maryland, it's harder. But in the federal market, we don't care where you're at. If you're in Guam, you can be doing IT business here in uh, Virginia or Maryland or the DC area. So um, there's a huge advantage in there. But one of the biggest things uh, I'll leave you with this slide is when you're all in on the federal market, the experience you get every month, every six months, a year, you're getting so much more experience, so much um, your past performance. I'll talk about this in a minute, really apply. But when you're on the commercial side, it's like you're starting over every single new customer you try to go into. Um, so, uh, by the way, I didn't say on the left-hand side, you can see this menu agenda I'm trying to follow. I'm going to talk about why the federal market is ideal. Then I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the federal acquisition lifecycle and the workforce as ways to reinforce why the federal market is so good. But let's, stop, uh, let's start at the very high level, right, of why the federal market is ideal. Um, and here are just some of the reasons why. So the first one, no particular order, right? is that um, the federal market has one supplier portal. There's thousands of commercial businesses out there. There's thousands of state and local uh, entities out there. You have to register in every single one of them. But in the federal market, there's one supplier portal that uh, rules them all, right? And this is SAM.gov. This is a unique thing. And part of the beauty of this is that when the buyers, and I'll talk about how many there are, but when the buyers are looking for a company like you, they know that they can go to the supplier portal. They know that here's an interested vendor who wants to sell to us and they begin to learn more about you. It also, um, it's public information. So you have the ability to go in and find other suppliers that maybe you can team with, et cetera. So this supplier portal, this one supplier portal for the entire federal government is a very ideal reason for being in the federal market. The second thing is their set of rules. Every entity that's not the federal market has their own rules. You have to learn your own rules. You have to get different experts. But if I hire one person who's a FAR expert, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, right, the rule book for acquisition in the federal government, they will be able to help me with every single contract I ever do within the federal market. They'll help me in the FBI. They'll help me in DOD and the Navy. They'll help me in the Department of Education because the federal market has basically one set of uh, rules that guide the acquisition approach. 
right? I'm, and I don't pretend to be the expert on the federal rules at all, right? But you have um, the CFFCR or something. Somebody could throw that in. There's that, which then leads to the FAR, and they got the defense FAR and the VA FAR. But basically, they're all the same thing. It's a federal acquisition regulation. We tweak it a teeny bit on certain agencies, but not enough to make a difference. So that one person I bring in can become an expert. As I learn about the FAR, I can become an expert at a certain level, right? At a small business level, not at a contracting officer level. The third one, and which I'm now figuring I should have put bullet numbers on. Uh, the third one, past performance, right? If you're in, like I said, in the commercial side or state and local, New York's not going to really care what you're doing in Texas. They want to know what have you done here recently. They'll balance it a little bit. But compare that to uh, the Yelp of the federal government, this thing called CPARS, right? And somebody can tell you what CPARS means in the chat. But the idea of um, CPARS and having one central repository for past performance is that when you do good work over here, it's visible to all of your uh, potential customers, all of your potential buyers within the federal market. Let's say you send a capability statement. Well, where would somebody on the commercial side be able to learn more? You know, they could go into the uh, into your website, but that's you talking about your successes. But if you go into if the buyer goes into CPARS and sees um, other past performance ratings that you've gotten, like one of my customers has gotten all sorts of uh, exceptional, which is exceptional, right? It's awesome. And so you want those potential buyers to be able to look in and see an unfiltered review of your company by another federal buyer. This builds trust within your customer base. Uh, the next one is open opportunity list, right? Going back to Sam.gov, which is a big tool, but Sam um, has the opportunity list. There's a lot of places where you can get opportunities, but Sam is the primary place. It's the one place where many, many opportunities are. And so that if, if you're looking for opportunities, you can come in there. When you think about state, local, um, it's all these different places. Yes, there's some subscription services you can do, but commercial, some of those opportunities are just hidden. But the federal government, the federal buyer must tell industry about the opportunities. There's certain restrictions, like if it's uh, coming out on Seaport Next Gen, then they're only going to let the Seaport Next Gen contract holders know, which is fine. That's how the government works. But they're transparent compared to commercial. You have to drum up business really hard. Um, and then the next one, standard acquisition lifecycle. I'll show you this later. But basically, the federal government has one way of buying. We start here and we move here. They do things like coming in and saying, look, you can't sit there and accept a cup of coffee from a vendor um, and let bias happen in. We have conflicts of interest rules. You can't be over an opportunity if you know the potential vendor, things like that. The good old boy system, it's being broken down, right, where you can't just go out and buy somebody a fancy dinner and you're going to get a contract. So this um, standard acquisition lifecycle, as they go forward, um, it levels the playing field for many of us. Yes, there's still a lot of leveling to be done. But the transparency of the life cycle is what makes it easy. And so you can go into a lot of areas to find it. I'm going to show you a diagram of one today that you can ask for. Um, but this, the cycle is the same compared to if you go into Maryland or California or Idaho or something, right? Every state, every locality, every uh, commercial company has their own buying process, their own acquisition life cycle. That makes it so much harder for you to sell. Uh, I did not put it in here, but going with that life cycle, the federal government buys huge chunks of work where commercial and state and local, they tend to do something closer to six month contracts. Federal government routinely does five year contracts. These type of things are awesome. They're able to do it through this streamlined acquisition approach. Um, and then the last thing is long range acquisition. So I talked about Sam has opportunities, sources, sought, things like that. But I can look out a year or two for some agencies and see what they're forecasting. I can see what's coming down. That's much harder to do in the state and local, and it's it's near impossible in commercial. Unless you're in there talking with people, you're not really going to hear about it. But in the federal space, they work really hard to try to communicate, hey, this is what we're going to have in six, 12 months. This is what we're thinking about doing. So um, these, these six bullets that I just shared with you, these are just some of the reasons why it's ideal to be in the federal market if you're in here. There's so much in place to help you be a success if you can just learn the process learn some of the tools and um, move forward. Okay, so I just mentioned this one. If you'd like a copy of this, put roadmap please into the chat. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a new friend yesterday and, and uh, he wrote back to me and something. he's like, please and thank you. And I was like, oh my God, you've been in one of my trainings. Please and thank you go a long way. Um, we really appreciate that. And, and I do it to you, right? So 
uh, if you want a copy of this, um, uh, this is a uh, procurement lifecycle roadmap from the USDA. If you'd like a copy of this, I'll be happy to send you a, a handout that we have that with this. But anyways, what I wanted to share with you is uh, when I was talking about there's this formal process, this is an example of the process um, in the federal government where you can uh, learn it, where sometimes in the commercial and state and local, it's just impossible to even get this information. This is uh, really a goldmine roadmap for me. I was like, thank you. Somebody put it visually. They took the FAR or whatever and they made it visual. Um, and, I, and I'm going to get this from every agency out there that I can and share it with you. But the idea of this roadmap that I love about it is um, it gives me a clear understanding that if there's an opportunity I want to pursue, I can look into this roadmap and try to figure out where is that opportunity in the journey, which allows me to understand how can I influence or participate in that opportunity's journey. You uh, want to put or you want to find this roadmap for your own target agency, right? I always tell people you should have one target agency, but go ask your uh, buyers, potential buyers, small business specialists, whoever say, hey, can I get a copy of your procurement roadmap? You know, the journey and acquisition life cycle or a, a requirement goes through. By the way, do me a favor while you're putting in roadmap, please. Can you tell me which agency you are targeting? I'd be curious that if I can see a bunch of you respond with certain agencies, uh, my team and I can just sort those and see which agencies are the most uh, put, you know, put into the chat and I'll go find these roadmaps for you. So uh, put your target agency into the chat. All right, so uh, just tracking this as you go along, right? The idea of um, this roadmap, and I, and I wanna come back, I know some of you are advanced, some of you are new, but this idea of when you look at the, uh, the requirement as it's coming through the acquisition life cycle or procurement life cycle, this early stage is the part I was really looking for, right? Is you're, this is where they have ideas and they're thinking about it. It's the chance to shift all the way left to get in there and influence um, the potential program office folks, right? And then as you swing around the bottom to the second row, you've got market research and vendor engagement. This is perhaps when the contracting officer and, and their team is starting to put out sources sought RFI notices out there. Um, and, and they start moving it forward, right? This phase here, if you're not familiar with it, developing an independent government cost estimate. Uh, people make it sound so complicated, but basically the government's just trying to do a guess. How much do we think this is gonna cost? I want a chair. What's our independent uh, cost estimate? I don't know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks? Okay, there's our guess. That's what we think. Now they have that to measure against the um, what you provide back to them. And two things about it. First off, if you're a contracting officer, don't talk to me about the details of it because I'm not trying to be overly detailed. I'm trying to tell uh, industry and you, I want to make sure you understand that th you want to get in before before they do this independent co uh, government cost estimate, because this is where you can get them to stop thinking lowest technical acceptable price or whatever, low price, right? We don't want them to lowball the, the thing. You wanna be able to talk to them about, hey, you're probably gonna be looking for people with senior experience here because of this risk, this risk, or this risk or something. This is what we do when we're doing capture, we're shaping the opportunity. And the sooner you can get in, the more chance you can influence, for example, they're thinking on what this is gonna cost. Look, this is not a $1 million contract. This is a $15 million contract. Okay. And then they just got to go find the money if the requirement is important enough. And the same thing as you come along, you'll start seeing that they've got all these different activities that are in here um, where they're shaping the acquisition. And to me, this is where I'm uh, trying to influence the NAICS code or the certifications, uh, the set aside or the um, contract vehicle, all those kind of things. You want to be getting in here early so that as they're starting to do that acquisition strategy formation, you've at least had a chance to say, hey, I think this best goes here. Um, and so I'm not going to go too far on the rest of this, but this is a great one. If you want the copy of this, just put roadmap, please, into the chat. So um, I want to move in and kind of wrap up with two slides, I think, I, that I have on the workforce. So I talked about the roadmap, right? One of the things in the, uh, again, just comparing the federal market to the commercial market, the commercial market, you're just out there everywhere trying to, um, uh, you know, meet different organizations and they really don't have much to do with each other at all. But in the federal market, they do. And so here's just one example. This is a little older document and it's a lot bigger now, like this 180 or 157 number is now closer to 190 uh, plus on acquisition workforce. But this diagram is showing you the DOD civilian, not military acquisition workforce. And it shows them across different fields. And again, I'm not trying to be an expert on this. But what I'm trying to point out is right here, you see contracting, 26,000 people. 
But then you have all these other people in different career fields who are responsible for acquisition. And so engineering, you know, people down here in test and evaluation or IT. And, and the idea is, if you really think about this, these people have a chance of knowing each other. Not all 7,000 IT people will know each other, but if you have a target agency and you look to one contracting officer in the army who's doing IT and you begin to look somewhere else, well, the chances of them knowing each other um, are much more likely. They go to similar events. They might go to DAU and, and do training over there, et cetera. But there's just a massive volume of buyers within the federal market that you can find their contact information for, which is really difficult to do it all in the commercial side and, and state and local, and certainly not at this level. Here's another way of looking at this, right? I talked about people who are acquisition personnel, um, but one of the other things to keep in mind is there's so many people involved in the sales life cycle that you're gonna be going through. And the reason this is great is because these are the people that, can, uh, that you can work with and build relationships with during business development and capture activities. And so there's people in that planning and requirement activity when they're thinking of the ideas, right? Think about this first one, planning and requirements as the as the um, the program office is coming up with the ideas. We should do this. We should do that. Then you got somebody having to face reality in the blue here where it's cost estimation, right? They're, they're having to look at this and go, well, what's it going to cost? Can we afford that? Can it even go into the budgeting? And then it moves forward. Again, not trying to be a financer or contracting officer expert. I'm saying from a sales perspective, you want to understand this process. And then you got program management and people who are executing it, like the core and others. All of those people, the whole journey of a requirement the government might have, um, you have this two things. It's this understanding of the path that a requirement will go or in your, uh, in your world, an opportunity. But also you have the ability to find the people behind this. And as you work with these people, they introduce you to other people. This is so doable within the federal market because the, the federal market works pretty closely with each other, right? EPA is not gonna work that closely with the army, but the Navy's working with the army, for example, right? And these are bigger spenders than any commercial or state and local world you'll pop into. So here's what I want you to remember from today's training, right? Is the first thing is um, don't just drop, just cause I'm saying be all in on federal, don't drop your non-federal clients, keep them, um, keep moving forward. What I'm saying is look in the federal and go, if I wanna be in the federal, let me go all in, let me lean in and build a $50 million company in the federal space. You won't really build that in the commercial. This is just proven over and over again out there. But if you lean in on the federal for new growth, then you can service the current customers you have um, and then just kind of let them fall out. Uh, and then the second one is focus on growing those federal clients, right? Uh, go watch some previous training I did. I think I did training yesterday, the day before about the stages of growing and the revenue streams. I teach you how to go find uh, those opportunities. And again, if you want to copy of that roadmap I showed, just put roadmap please, into the chat. Um, I do all this training for free. I want to make sure everybody out there has access. So uh, if you know other people are interested, make sure you invite them to the training. If you're ready to sit there and accelerate your growth, you're looking for our help, just check us out on govconchamber.com. Uh, you can check out how to work with us, but also we have a ton of other good content out there that I just can't, uh, I just don't have the time to share here on LinkedIn. But just go to govconchamber.com, learn more about us, learn how to work with us. For all of us, as you're moving forward, remember, Government contracting, it's not a secret, it's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.